Hi, my name is Porva Gopal, and today I'll be talking about the role of diet in the management of inflammatory bowel disease. You must wonder why I chose this particular topic. Well, this disease sneaked its way into my family's life six years back when my perfectly healthy mother was diagnosed with IBD and thus began her journey of enduring this disease and a journey of watching her fight it with unparalleled bravery. So this year, when I was considering selecting a topic of research, I thought, why not deep dive into this topic a little more and further understand it on an academic level? What exactly is inflammatory bowel disease, also known as IBD? Well, IBD is characterized as an autoimmune disease where in which an individual's own body system attacks the it, it own cells attacks the body, specifically the gastrointestinal tract. IBD can be separated into two branches, Crohn's and colitis. In Crohn's disease, influences any area of the gastrointestinal tract from mouth to anus. However, on the other hand, ulcerative colitis specifically targets the large intestine and extends to the rectum, as you can see by the diagram. Symptoms vary in severity. However, both the ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease present similar symptoms, including diarrhea, blood in the stool, varying degrees of abdominal pain, and weight loss, which is the most prominent. Inflammation and the immune system. The immune system serves as the body's major safeguard against infection, illnesses, and disease. So when encountered with this autoimmune disease, the immune system is tricked into attacking its own perfectly healthy cells. And this process is often a result of one's genetics and these predisposed genes that can cause defective immune regulation. So dysbiosis, what is that exactly? It's a dysregulated immune response observed in the process of IBD. And basically, during dysbiosis, there's a disruption to the microbiome. And this diagram depicts this process because you can witness the changes in the functional activities. These, these organisms that are normally not supposed to be there have been in, are intruding the gut. So a period barrier dysfunction is a result of dysbiosis where the barrier to the immune system is disrupted and then mucosal permeability, incre permeability increases, causing the bad bacteria and these microorganisms that can harm the body to be let inside. So how, how can diet influence IBD? Well, diet plays an integral role in the development of inflammatory bowel disease and continues to act as a mediator of intestinal inflammation once disease sets in. And diet can give us a better understanding about how the microbiome functions. By using diet as a therapeutic treatment option for IBD, patients will be able to manage, better manage gut inflammation and other symptoms. Well, you must be thinking, how does this relate to me? Well. As said by the famous French lawyer, politician, and gastronome, Jean Antome Briat Salven, you are what you eat. There's often a sense of confusion on which diets can be the most beneficial for the symptom management of IBD. That's why I took it upon myself to analyze these diets that have been shown to be the most relevant, some of which include the Western diet, the Mediterranean diet, the specific carbohydrate diet, the inclusive internal nutrition diet, and the low FODMAP diet. Classifying diets. One cookie a day doesn't do any harm, but despite how badly we want to, having a dietary pattern that predominantly consists of junk food can be harmful to us in the long term. In order to identify which diets will be the most beneficial for IBD patients, we must know the difference between high diet quality and low diet quality. One who has a high diet quality probably consumes unrefined, minimally processed foods, such as the fruits and vegetables your parents really want you to eat. And those who have a high diet quality also eat a lot of anti-inflammatory foods, which are less likely to trigger the gut. And an example of a high diet a diet with good dietary patterns is the Mediterranean diet. On the other hand, low diet quality consists of highly processed snack foods, sugar-sweetened beverages, and that pack of Doritos that you had for lunch. 
And low diet quality includes pro-inflammatory foods, which can trigger inflammation in the gut. And one example of this is the Western diet. The specific carbohydrate diet, or also known as SCD. The specific carbohydrate diet restricts certain carbohydrates, including disaccharides and most polysaccharides. The reasoning behind this is that they eliminate carbohydrates based on the assumption that they have the most influence on the, the gut microbiota, maintenance, and growth. By restricting certain carbohydrates, the diet believes that, what, that the harmful bacteria in the gut will not be there to fuel the harm. There will be no fuel to to feed these harmful bacteria, so they won't be able to grow, thus decreasing the inflammation. This diet allows most, almost all fruits, some vegetables, nuts, meats, and eggs, and avoids certain starches, sugar, and most preservatives. In comparison to the Mediterranean diet, the SCD is very restrictive in nature, while the Mediterranean diet is very is more lenient and flexible. The SCD diet can often result in vitamin deficiency and weight loss. And the Mediterranean diet has proof in a study comparing these two diets has proof in achieving fecal calprotectin response and C-reactive protein response. However, there is no evidence for that in SCD. The SCD limits carbohydrates, as I said above. It doesn't restrict meats, and it restricts processed foods, food additives, and it's dairy-free, grain-free, and soy-free. While the Mediterranean diet does, does restrict, um, is mostly plant-based, but minimally processed foods are allowed in certain occasions. And grains and dairy are also allowed. And the Mediterranean diet can be easily customized to a patient's needs. The low FODMAP diet. This diet specifically limits fructose, lactose, fructins, galactins, polyols, and has been shown to be effective in improving IBS symptoms. So IBD patients who also present IBS symptoms choose to follow this diet. And the low FODMAP diet stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. Inclusive in internal nutrition. This diet is a specialized nu liquid nutritional formula that is taken over a period of six to eight weeks. And this formula-based diet is designed to induce remission in patients who suffered from specifically Crohn's disease. And this diet proves to be beneficial to those who want to avoid medication, such as steroids. And it aimed to in, in, achieve endoscopic healing and decrease mu mucosal cytokine production and improves the quality of life in most Crohn's disease patients. Concluding thoughts. Diet interplays with the microbiome. A nutrient deficient diet can disrupt the homeostasis of the microbiome by changing its functional and compositional metabolic activities. Eliminating certain foods from one's diet can help reduce unwanted symptoms like inflammation. A healthy diet reduces inflammation, provides health benefits, and encourages a better overall quality of life. So when, when one patient is choosing to adhere to a specific diet, whether it is EEN, SCD, low FODMAP, patients should deliberate the pros and cons of each one and choose whichever diet is most likely to moderate their specific symptoms. With the rapid increase in awareness that people have acquired about the importance of diet, it is likely that diet will make its way as a preferable option for the treatment of IBD. Thank you. My project is about understanding the value of music therapy on speech impairments. I am Zoe Lin, a sophomore at Homestead High School. So let's start with some background information. So there is one very common cause of speech impairment, which is neurological disorders. And some common disorders include Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, ALS, and autism spectrum disorder. And neurological disorders all vary significantly from one another as they all have their own unique characteristics and symptoms. However, one common symptom across most, if not all neurological disorders is speech impairment. Speech includes a very complex network 
which involves several parts of the brain, mostly in the frontal, frontal and temporal lobes. So one of the key areas of speech is Broca's area, and it's responsible for turning our thoughts into spoken words that we can communicate with. So damaged Broca's area results in non-fluent aphasia, where an individual can understand speech but cannot express or speak it. On the other hand, Wernicke's area is responsible for comprehending and processing speech. So damage to this area results in fluent aphasia, where an individual can speak, but their words have no meaning and their sentences will not follow any grammatical rules. There's also several other parts of the brain associated with speech, but these two are the main ones. So there are four, well, there's actually several types of speech impairment, but I highlighted four of the more common ones. So the first is apraxia of speech, apraxia of speech, which is often caused by um, autistic spectrum disorder. And it's when the neural pathway between speech muscles and the brain is damaged. So individuals will know what they wanna say, but they can't express it. Next is probably one of the most common types of speech impairment, aphasia. So 1 million Americans have some form of it, and it's especially common after brain injury, stroke, or neurodegenerative disease. Another common speech impairment is stuttering, which is characterized by its repeated sounds, syllables, words, and it is associated with neurological disorders such as aphasia and also brain injuries. And lastly, dysarthria is linked to Parkinson's disease. In fact, 90% of people who have Parkinson's disease also have some form of dysarthria, and it's caused by nerve or damage to muscles needed for speech. So how are music and speech related? So music is extremely complex with many different components. For example, music has pitch and also has rhythm. And both of these components will activate different areas of the brain. So as you can see on the right on figure one, um, this shows all the different regions of the brain that are activated by music. And additionally, the rhythm of music is similar to fluency of speech. So there's a lot of similarities between the two. So how can music therapy help? Overlap between music and speech processing in the brain as talked about before. So this means that basically anything that happens to um, networks involving music, these effects also transfer over to the speech networks. And music therapy has been shown to increase neuroplastic capacity, which is important for recovering from brain injuries and also strokes. And in addition, Music therapy repeatedly engages the same musical neural networks. And when that you do that, you strengthen these networks. And since some of these networks are also used for speech, these speech networks are essentially also being strengthened. So there's two types of music therapy. Active music therapy, which involves playing music, composing, or singing. And passive music therapy, which is just music perception. So listening to music or moving to the beat of the music. So studies have shown that active music therapy yields higher levels of responsiveness. However, both are useful for different purposes. For example, active music therapy may be used for a patient who has ASD and you want to encourage them to talk more. So using music therapy like singing will help them talk more. However, um, a minimally conscious patient may not be able to engage in active music therapy, so passive music therapy may be used instead to try to gain a response from them. So my project goal was to review recent studies to understand how we can utilize music therapy to help those with speech impairments. So in my paper, I reviewed several cases, um, but I highlighted the five, in my opinion, were the most important. So the first one looked at two cases of minimally conscious patients. So there's actually two studies included in this study. So the first study showed that music therapy did not benefit the patient's responsiveness compared to silence. However, the study did note that they used a long period of music, about 15 minutes, which may actually have had a relaxing effect because usually studies use 30 seconds to one minute of music. And the second study looked at the different tempos of music. So it showed that faster tempo or faster speed of music yielded greater number of successful responses. The next case looked at children with autism spectrum disorder. 
And it actually looked at 364 children with ASD across nine different countries. And there was no statistical difference between non-intensive music therapy, intensive music therapy, and usual treatment. The third case looked at music therapy on brain injuries, and it showed that music therapy is beneficial for communication. It is especially beneficial when the impairment is caused by a stroke. So the next case is a little bit different. It focused primarily on Parkinson's disease, and it was also a systematic review of 11 studies, and 10 out of the 11 studies showed a positive effect of singing on speech impairment, and, pot, and um, music therapy, um, include singing. And the last one looked again at children with autism spectrum disorder, and it was a systematic review of 34 studies of five which were on speech impairments, and four of these five showed statistically significant improvement from music therapy. So as you can see, the results are kind of all over the place, and that is due to a lot of flaws in this field of research. So um, to start off, it is hard to generalize um, because studies have a very limited sample population, often including only one person. They all have a very unique and specific condition, which is hard to replicate in other studies. In addition, time period is an issue because many benefits of music therapy show after a couple of years. However, many studies are only done over a course of a couple of weeks or months. Third, there is a very vague definition of music therapy. So music therapy is like an umbrella term. It has many different methods under it. For example, one highly debated topic is whether singing is considered music therapy. And it's also hard to know which form of music therapy worked in a study since there's no universal terms for the different methods of music therapy. So many times studies just make up their own names for what they use. Next, there is a lack of controls. Since many studies are done by a case-to-case -case basis, um, there won't be any controls used. So often you'll see a benefit in the patient, but you're unsure if that benefit is actually from music therapy or if that same result could have been attained just from usual treatment. And lastly, unknown cause of speech impairments. So we don't always know the cause of speech impairments. And while the symptoms may seem similar, the different causes will mean that some treatments will work on some and some won't. And this will lead to mixed results in a seemingly similar group, which can create a lot of confusion. Um, so there is a lot more research that needs to be done, but there is also a lot of promise with music therapy. And hopefully we can use music therapy to help the 18.5 million individuals struggling with speech impairment. Here are my references. Thank you for listening. Hello. Today I'll be presenting on my research on galvanic cells and the change in efficiency that they see when their electrolytes are mixed. So what is a galvanic cell? A galvanic cell is a cell made up of electrolytes and connected by, which are connected by a salt bridge. A salt bridge is essentially another electrolyte that maintains electric, electrochemical equilibrium inside each cell. This image right here is an example of a galvanic cell. It is very similar to the one I ran, and it contains the two salts, zinc sulfate and copper sulfate. And uh, it's an re oxidation reduction or redox reaction that occurs where the zinc is being oxidized and losing electrons, turning into zinc ion, and the copper ions in the, the solution are turning into solid copper and connecting to the electrodes. The electron always flows from the zinc to the copper, and that is where the electricity is generated. Uh, what is an oxidation reduction uh, reaction? That is what I have just briefly explained there. It, oxidation is a loss of electrons and the anode is always oxidized. The anode in this, uh, in this galvanic cell right here is, this, is the zinc. And the reduction is the gain of electrons. And it, while it may seem counterintuitive, it's actually because when you gain an electron, your charge goes down and thus it's reduced. And uh, electrons move from the anode to the cathode, which is very important for the experiment I ran. And this oxidation reduction reaction that occurs 
that is another reason why we need this a salt bridge because as the salt in the copper is being depleted, there's an excess of sulfate, which is, has a negative charge and you cannot have a solution have a negative charge. So the, uh, so the salt bridge will induce a positively charged cation to help balance out the charge. The experiment I ran was, I had a controlled uh, zinc, uh, zinc sulfate and copper sulfate battery, which has a cell potential of 1.10 volts. And I, it, and I ran that at, for four hours and uh, measured how the electricity changes during those four hours. Then I mixed the electrolytes to proportions of 10 and 90%, 20 and 80% of copper sulfate to zinc sulfate, uh, 40 to 60, 30 to 70, and 50, 50. And I observed them for four hour durations, all in the same uh, location under the same controlled variables all which were temperature and location and the similar beakers, which I all worked all contained the same volume, same, molar same molarity of salt in both sides and the same molarity of salt in the salt bridge. Uh, I used a multimeter an electric multimeter, which reported data directly to my computer, which I then graphed on a spreadsheet. And um, what I was looking for was how efficiency changed as solution content changed. The applications of this experiment are that batteries are used very often in our day-to-day -day lives. The ex experiment was testing the efficiency of batteries as, electro as electrolyte mixtures change. And since all, ele the, the electric, the all electric future depends on batteries, as we will be running on electric cars, we will need a lot of fuel cells, this experiment is very important to see how galvanic cells in particular can be used and how we can get the most efficient galvanic cells when in terms of electrolyte mixtures. My results, we noticed a clear reduction of performance when electrolytes were mixed. It was almost a linear-like relationship until it was 50-50. After that, it rebounded back up and you could see a kind of like an absolute value, a curve when it hit the 50-50 mark. As 50-50, you almost lost 80% to heat as the electrolytes would interfere with each other from reacting. Uh, control battery, uh, the control battery reached 90 to 95% of max performance of the 1.10 volt uh, potential, it would reach around 1.04, 1.0, whereas the 50-50 battery almost didn't even hit like 0.2 volts. It was, a, it was actually a shocking result of how poorly it did. This, the battery in addition also failed to uh, keep the, its energy and rather than unreacting, the redox reaction occurred but lost a lot of its energy to heat rather than converting it to electricity, which told me that the salt bridge was failing at keeping electrochemical equilibrium and that the solution was actually undergoing changes at the chemical level, which was also a poor thing. This excess heat that was noticed could also be damaging to our to the materials that surrounded. Like if there was a galvanic cell in your phone, you not, don't want that phone overheating due to a battery problem. And that why this result was actually very shocking and very dangerous indeed. The conclusions of this experiment from, was that it is crucial to keep electrolytes separate in a battery. And that as it, it will one overheat and that since battery technology is rapidly improving, it, this research, since it's a step in that movement, is helping to affirm that it is crucial to keep the electrolyte separate. And as it was lost to so much to heat, we think of batteries as a solution to global warming and, and a help in stopping climate change. But if they're releasing heat, then it's also not helping much as this energy is just wasted. And that is very, very bad for our environment and it will, as we will be going into an all electric future that will essentially negate the benefits the battery ever sees. Uh, another conclusion from this experiment was that uh, a battery when mixed at, when it's at its whole, you can like when it's 100%, 100% like the control battery was, we go back here, uh, as it's just a pure galvanic cell they are actually pretty effective. They usually hit 90 to 95% efficiency, which is a very good efficiency for a battery. And they can be trusted to perform tasks, especially if you can make smaller galvanic cells produce that 
the level of voltage and combine them up, you can create actually a pretty large voltage, which can help you run your day-to-day -day tasks. Thank you for listening. And I hope you read my research article. Hi, my name is Catherine Way, and I'll be presenting on a review I've been putting together on CAR T cell therapy. Uh, cancer is one of the leading causes of death worldwide, accounting for nearly 10 million deaths in 2020. And one of the newest, most promising treatments for cancer is chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy, or CAR T cell therapy, which involves genetically engineering the body's own T cells to target cancer cells. CAR T cells are able to overcome immune tolerance mechanisms by combining the effector functions of T cells and the ability of antibodies to recognize surface antigens in a non MHC restricted manner. Um, CAR T cells are made up of four main components, uh, the first being the antigen binding domain, which is a portion of the CAR that allows for target antigen specificity. Um, it consists of a single chain variable fragment made up of the uh, variable heavy and variable light chains of an antibody linked by a peptide spacer, and this is what allows the uh, CAR T cell to recognize and bind to the target ant epitope. Um, the hinge region is an extracellular uh, stru structural region that provides flexibility to overcome steric hindrance and allows the antigen binding domain to access the target epitope by ex extending the binding units away from the transmembrane domain. So as such, the length of the hinge is crucial to facilitate binding of the CAR to its target antigen. The transmembrane domain is just what anchors the CAR to the T cell membrane, but it can also influence CAR T cell expression level and stability and also cytokine production. And finally, the intracellular signaling domains are crucial to the construction of the optimal CAR and as such have been the focus of the most attention in CAR engineering. First generation CARs contain a single signaling domain, but second generation CARs contain dual signaling domains. Um, this addition of a co-stimulatory endodomain has been shown to increase proliferation and persistence in vivo. As a novel, innovative treatment option, CAR T-cell therapy offers many exciting advantages that other treatments do not. One of the major advantages is the short treatment time compared to conventional treatments such as chemotherapy. Um, another is the effectiveness. Cl clinical studies have shown CAR T cell therapy to be very successful in treating hematological mal malignancies, um, ALL, and large B cell lymphomas. Um, for example, a phase two trial for Yascarta involving 111 patients with uh, large B cell lymphomas showed an objective response rate of 82% and a complete response rate of 54%. Additionally, in, con in contrast to chemotherapy, which is only effective at killing cancer cells within a short window of administration, CAR T cells persist and proliferate in the body, which allows the them to continue treating relapses that occur after the initial cancer has become undetectable. One recent study has shown that CAR T cells can actually remain detected in patients more than 10 years after the initial infusion of CAR T cells, um, and these CAR T cells retain their cytotoxic characteristics and continue to maintain functional activity and proliferation. However, despite these advantages, CAR T cell therapy has also um, it also has certain drawbacks and risks associated with it. Uh, the first being the financial burden. Um, according to a 2018 study, a treatment course of Yascarta can cost um, up to $373,000, not including any additional doctor's appointments or any costs outside of the drug itself. Um, another drawback to CAR T cell therapy are the side effects and toxicities associated with it. Um, the most common being cytokine release syndrome, or CRS. Um, this is a potentially life-threatening complication that results from rapid immune activation by CAR T-cells and the prompt release of large amounts of cytokines into the blood. So CRS can cause symptoms such as fevers, muscle flakes, and fatigue, which can escalate to potentially fatal vasodilatory shock, capillary leak, hypoxia, and, and organ damage. Symptoms of neurotoxicities um, after CAR T-cell infusion can include encephalopathy, confusion, delirium, and seizures, and neurotoxicities are also a common side effect of CAR T-cell therapy. So there are several limitations to CAR T-cell therapy um, currently, but much research is being done into strategies to eliminate these limitations and also expand the uses of CAR T-cell therapy. So one of the current limitations is the possible development of tumor resistance single antigen targeting CARs. While single antigen targeting CAR T cells can initially deliver high response rates, a significant number of patients display partial or total loss of target antigen expression on tumor cells. One strategy to overcome this is to target multiple antigens via a dual, dual uh, CAR constructs or tandem CARs to prevent the loss or down regulation of antigens seen with single antigen targeting CARs. 
Another challenge of CAR T cell therapy is on target off tumor toxicities, which can occur when tumor antigens found on normal healthy tissue are accidentally targeted by CAR T cells. One potential solution is to target tumor restricted post translational modifications to better, to better direct CAR T cells to cancerous cells and minimize toxicities. Um, CAR T cells are also limited by the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment and physical tumor. Uh, barriers that prevent CAR T cells from trafficking to and infiltrating solid tumors. Uh, one strategy it would be to overcome these limitations by using local administration, um, eliminating the need for CAR T cells to traffic to disease sites through the, uh, through the bloodstream. Another potential strategy is to engineer CAR T cells to work their way through physical barriers such as a tumor stroma um, to access the tumor itself. For example, a major component of the stroma is heparin sulfate proteoglycan, or HSPG. So researchers have designed CAR T cells that can express uh, heparinase, which is an enzyme that degrades HSPG. Um, as discussed earlier, one of the major risks of CAR T cell therapy is cytokine release syndrome. And these symptoms can range from relatively um, trivial, for, like fatigue, diarrhea, headache, to um, cardiac dysfunction, respiratory failure, multi-organ system failure, and death in more severe cases. And CRS is a very common side effect of treatment, unfortunately, as one study has shown that 77 to 93% of patients with leukemia receiving CAR T cell therapy experience CRS. To combat these side effects, researchers are developing strategies to minimize toxicities. One strategy is to alter the culture of the CARs themselves to minimize complications of treatment. Um, for example, anti-CD19 cars with modified hinge and transmembrane regions have been shown to produce lower levels of cytokines and proliferate slower, while still retaining their same potent um, cytolytic activity. Additionally, certain co-stimulatory domains, such as the 41BB domains, have a lower risk of toxicities, so the structure of the CAR T cell itself can have a great influence on preventing toxicities. Another way that CAR T cell therapy can result in toxicities is from the host immune system recognizing and attacking the CAR T cells themselves. Um, using human or humanized antibody fragments instead of murine-derived CARs or modifying hinge and transmembrane domains to decrease CAR immunogenicity can help alleviate um, adverse side effects. Additionally, implementing off switches or suicide genes could allow for the selective decrease of CAR T cells after the onset of, of, of adverse events. So for example, CARs can be engineered to express CD20, which facilitates depletion of CAR T cells via treatment with rituximab. However, a downside to this is that it is relatively slow and could be inefficient in treating patients with, that require immediate reversal due to severe acute cytokine-mediated toxicities. So faster switches have been created, such as inducible Cas9, which can actually eliminate more than 90% of CAR T cells within 30 minutes. Also, CAR T cells can be temporarily inhibited uh, by using dasatinib, um, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor to suppress the activation of T cells through inhibiting proximal TCR signaling kinases. Unlike methods that completely destroy the CAR T cells, this could allow for the rescue of CAR T cell therapy after toxicity subside. So yeah, CAR T cells are an exciting new treatment for cancer that is expanding the field of cancer immunotherapy. However, a lot of research is still being done into ways to produce safer and more effective CARs and also to expand the use of CAR T cells. Thank you for watching. Hello, I'm Ho Yuan De. Today, I will present my colleague's project that had, had been working on this summer. An analysis of the three typical types of airplanes, high-speed jets, commercial airliners, and a sailplane. I will first explain why I chose the three types, then explain the procedure and the result of my project, which is in two parts, the brief analysis of the previous designs and the prediction of future design with the reason, and finally, future topics to explore in the field. I will first explain why I chose the three types. The main reason is that they are clearly distinct in most parameters. Or more visually, I graphed it on a line as seen on the right of the screen. On top end of the line is a high-speed jet, having a typical top speed ranging from 1 to 5 to 2.5 miles, are not very fuel efficient and are mostly military. On the other end, it is a sailplane. They fly at the extremely low speeds, typically between 0.05 and 0.2 miles but are really efficient. 
They are usually for recreational uses. In the middle, there are a commercial airliners, which are made to carry passengers and have a medium speed and efficiency between the two. I chose them because those three planes can represent most of the applications of planes in general. I first went to the website of the manufacturers and searched for related papers, which allowed for an analysis of popular design trends over wing shapes, airfoils, and control surfaces during the years. Future explanation of why the designer chose the plane to build the planes like that are also included. Finally, I summarized the trend over the past two decades and chose a specific but representative plane for more precise data. I will then try to predict what type of plane will look like in the near future. I will first discuss the high-speed jets. They usually have small wings with high loading, or they are constantly under lots of stress because large wings generate lots of drag at those speeds, and they have to use small ones. And in order to make them generate sufficient lift, they have to be heavily loaded. Almost all have highly swept leading edges to decrease drag. Different from other types, low radar observation designs are also considered other than the aerodynamics, which will be more important as in the future, missiles start to be more and more advanced and uh, outperforming the missiles by maneuvering is almost impossible. This starts to replace the normal dogfight tactics because at the range of accuracy of missiles lancer, fighters won't be able to reach the previous combat distance. The control surfaces will be smaller as not as much maneuverability is required and wings will be st more steel shaped, more like trapezoids uh, than previous triangles. A new customer of high-speed planes also rises aside the original military ones, the commercial passenger industry. Several planes were proposed during the recent years, most famously the Boom Overture, a 2010 Mach 1.7 passenger plane. It was expected that 13 of the expected 128 million of passengers will that will fly first class in 2025 will be interested in supersonic transport. The second type is commercial airliners and is the least changing type. For the last 60 years, the wing configuration of the and the control surfaces of them hadn't changed much, remaining as a long wing with a moderate sweep or angle of it tilted backwards, uh, remaining instead of directly to the side, used mainly to decrease drag. This airfoil, however, experienced a major change. It is originally a normal airfoil, just like the other two types, but the, with the research of supercritical ones, which offer high cruise speed without costing fuel efficiency, it soon dominated the industry within a decade, starting with a300 in 1970s and was continuously improved, but not much other changes went into this field. The supercritical airfoil works by having a flat top surface, which decreases the acceleration of air on top of the airfoil and delays the shock, shock wave, which generates a lot of drag when air speed reaches Mach 1. The makeup for the lift decrease of the airfoil, the bottom of it is slightly, is significantly more curved than the normal one. And, and uh, it will be likely that except for the supersonic part just explained, the planes will remain largely the same in near future. There will be a slight chance, however, for blended wing body planes or ones shaped like the B2 spirit, except being much thicker to gain more volume for passengers. If this happens, it's likely that it will quickly take over the industry, but there's little chance for that to happen in the near future. 
Uh, although rose planes provide a better efficiency, its dry mass is also higher than the current planes and won't be economic for small payloads. The third type is the sail plane, covering the low speed, high efficiency end of the line. They are the most distinct of the types, marked by its extremely straight, long, and thin winds, aid to provide lift at low speed. It's also the most stable out of the three due to it being recreational and being stable decreases the risk of accidents. And does so by another quite unique feature, dihedral. It is the action of tilting the main wings upwards so that when the plane tilts sideways, the side going down generates more lift and rebalances the plane, keeping the, a pilot from doing the immense and difficult row stabilizing process. Scampers Quintus, the example we choose, utilizes this in a slightly different way. Its wings are constructed of parts of different dihedrals, forming a shape similar to an inverted arc, which benefited from the most slanted part, which provided the stability, and the flat part, which generates more lift. Another feature is the cross section of the fuselage. Its size suddenly decreases after the seat so that it will decrease, uh, experience a decrease in drag because of the more drop like, -like shape. Its control surfaces are usually small because such a light plane doesn't need a lot of forces to turn, and its large control surfaces generate a lot of drag when deployed. However, there are still many related fields that I hadn't touched due to the restraint of time, creating future opportunities. For example, I had only used rag words to describe the airfoils, instead of using simulations to tell how exactly they behave. This research doesn't include any interviews as well, which will provide more accurate information to some design changes and how they change the overall aerodynamics of the plane. This is my presentation. Thank you.